We need, we need some masala. We're making radical changes now in the amount of power used at the Phoenix. We're having to do that because our tilapia, we've gotten so into our tilapia, we have pumps going to aerate the water, and that's a must. They have to be, the water has to be aerated and circulated, and, uh, and it takes some power for them, and it's, it, that's one of those situations where it's put us in a pinch. We've either got to buy more panels or get smarter, and it just turns out that it's easy to get smarter in the last six or eight months because LED lighting is really getting out there. We, t we took a 50-watt uh, lighting situation and brought it down to 5 watts. That's like 10% of the power. We're going, the new houses are going to be all LED. We're going back and retrofitting the old houses. You can cause see it. The bulk of your load of, light, of uh, electricity in one of these buildings is lighting at night. You know, a little bit for a computer. And uh, how was the shower? Oh, I did a bath. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, good for you. We need the water. We need the water to flush. Now some people can use the toilet. We're working with Stewardship. They've been working together, and I wasn't polluting the planet. All right. It's the first time ever when I've taken a bath. It's incredible. So, uh, so yeah, the LED lighting then is getting to be, it, it comes in, it's strange how they put stuff out there. It kind of works against us a little bit because the best, easiest to find LED lighting is AC. And they do make DC, but it's only 12 volt. They make a few 24 volt DCs, and that's what we use in these buildings. So for us to keep our lighting, some house lighting, emergency house lighting, not on the AC inverter, we do have to use compact fluorescence. And see, compact fluorescence, we're were a big thing. They would they would cut it by 70% or something like that. But now we're, or no, maybe they'd cut it in half or whatever. They're much more uh, efficient than a regular incandescent bulb. But the LEDs are phenomenal. And they're getting to the point where they put them out. They make a lot of light now, too. So we're switching the whole Phoenix, which has taken us a while, over to LEDs. All of the new buildings will be LEDs. So we're... Uh, we're moving in the direction of cutting down the power use even further. And see a normal house, <clears throat> you can go into a normal house and put in LEDs these days. Uh, so, but still, this power system is small because the airship doesn't need much power. And uh, it used to be, you would even see in some of the older buildings, a slot for a generator because the backup generator just plugs in and charges through the system to the batteries. We don't even do that anymore. Uh, at the Phoenix, we have had done that recently because of the tilapia, but now we've got the LEDs happening, and they've more, they're more already more than compensating for the extra pumps for the tilapia. And uh, so the, the, uh, we don't use backup generators. We don't even prescribe them anymore in, in a re regular home because the power system is set up with safeguards so you can't really screw it up. And... Uh, and LED lighting, and just a minimal use of power. And that makes you get, and still, that minimal use of power, the power system ends up costing still 25 grand. And the nature of the building is, these, act, these buildings actually cost, say, 15% less than equivalent uh, conventional buildings, equivalent quality conventional buildings. But then you throw in the power, water, and sewage, that brings you up to the same or maybe 5% more. So it is the systems that, you, that make these buildings cost at least the same as conventional housing, but they make it so you have no utility bill. And having no utility bill is one thing. You know, having, having a house like the, the, one of the global models that we're selling, we're, able to guar we're guaranteeing to the realtor, if these people that buy this house in the first five years have over $100 a year utility bill, we'll pay it. That's how sure we are. Uh, so uh, that's where it's at is given, it's a savings in money, but it's more than a savings in money these days because it's a security. You're, you're in a home that you're not, you know, if the economy crashes, is your power going to go out? If there's a fuel shortage, is your power going to go out? 
not in a home that's independent. And I don't, I mean, I, I push the concept more than anything. In other words, maybe there are other ways to do all of this. I don't know who's doing it, but I, I welcome any of it. Uh, the point is be off of the grids, not just to be cheaper, but to be more secure. And then, of course, that ends up translating into carbon zero and uh, a, a soft footprint on the planet of people. The planet could support, you know, 50 times as many people as are on here now if they were, if they were living, see, if they were living in a way that enhanced the planet. Like, a, a lot of answers I get for my own thinking are from trees, like trees, uh, trees basically enhance the planet. They grow here, they, they drop their foliage and make dirt soil for new trees. They have their own photosynthesis. They have their own absorption of nutrients from the soil. They simply, and plus, they just make the planet better. They put out CO2, uh, I mean oxygen, and take in CO2, which fixes the planet so that mammals have a better situation because they need oxygen. And so the, the trees are actually almost the guardians of the planet. And we're, of course, lunching them right and left, the rainforests and everything. But you never hear anybody say there are too many trees. The trees are really the model citizens of the planet. And we're trying to make humans do the same as trees do in terms of just logic. It's not, it's not, uh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I even get, my feathers ruffled when people call me an environmentalist or something like that. I don't really buy all that. It's just logic, you know, that you, you, if you enhance the, the world around you, then you're basically uh, reinforcing your own existence, really. And so that's kind of the logic that's behind these buildings. And so the buildings are aimed at, uh, at treading softly on the planet and uh, making needing less, just needing less. But it doesn't mean, you know, you're doing without anything. It's meaning, it means that you're strategically gathering what you need. And that's the way this power system is set up. So, uh, so if you have over 275 Sundays a year, I suggest staying with PV panels and maybe experimenting with the thin film stuff. To we're, We are and we'll be putting it out on the website, what we learn and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. We just, yeah, we got some in, and uh, we, we, what we did is it in, in the Phoenix, when you go there, you, you've been there, I think. Oh, great. Yeah. They, the tilapia pond last fall got uh, below 60 degrees in the water is lethal for tilapia. They're a tropical fish. So we, we were just getting ready to have a fish fry, and all our fish died. And it was because the water got down to 58 degrees. So this year we got a swimming pool collector and it's got a thin film panel powering a little submersible boat village pump that shoves the water, whenever the sun's out, it shoves the water through the collector and, and it comes out. Uh, it's probably just gonna bump the water up enough to keep it above 60 degrees, it's working. And so we got a thin film solar panel to do that and we observed the other day, it was cloudy, the pump was still working. Uh, so it, it's like, uh, it, you know, with the typical panels, the pump would just go off. Right. So the thin film solar panels, they don't, everybody poo-poos them because they're, uh, they're not near as efficient. It takes more area for this amount of wattage uh, than it does for the actual full-on panels. But who cares, you know, area, you can, you, the thing is they make power in cloudy days. So What's the price comparison on the two? it ends up per watt being even a little less expensive. It's just they say they're not as durable for lasting forever. They're not as efficient. And so, the because see, everybody's out for, in the, in the real world out there, they need massive amounts of power to run their massive houses that have massive demands. The first thing on any level of survival is reduce your demands first. I mean, then, you know, if you're going to Everest on a trek, are you going to take your grand piano with you or not, you know? Uh, do you de you make a decision? Well, I want to stay alive up here, so I really don't think I'm going to take my grand piano. And so, the future is kind of a trek, 
really, for people to, uh, to deal with the future. So you're designing your life down. Again, you're not doing without. You're just, what's logical for you to take to Everest? What's logical for you to take into the future? So, uh, uh, so we, the buildings are designed down, and it turns out that we can power them fine with a, a, a minimal power system. So uh, that's kind of the, the rationale behind the overall design of the system. Then, then there are things like, okay, uh, to stay into solar panels for a minute, I mean, like, I, 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 if you do use wind, we are developing uh, in the history, uh, whether Kirsten showed it to you or not, I don't know. We had vertical axis windmills. We actually had one spin for 25 years with no maintenance. That's decent. Pillow block bearings, real basic. Sure, it's not as efficient as these little propeller ones, but the propeller ones are down every year. In other words, look at the overview. People tend to just go away from something if it's not as efficient. But look at it over time. Add the, add the element of time to any decision that you make, and it's going to vastly change your, your mind on things. I mean, as a matter of fact, add the element of time to the whole concept of fossil fuel. You know, it's going to vastly change your mind on whether to even participate in fossil fuel to any degree or not. So every decision that you make should be adding the element of time. But... So we are playing with vertical axis windmills that will be durable, that will last 25 years, that put out a little power. They're fun. It's fun to be setting, I've done it, to be setting at night watching a vertical axis windmill pump power into your batteries. And, you know, so then if it's raining, you're happy, you're getting water. If it's sunny, you're happy, you're getting power. If it's windy, you're happy, you're getting power. It's like you're happy all the time. You're always getting something from the, from the world around you. Uh, There's no more rainy day issues. Uh, but solar panels then, another thing to talk about with them is you'll see all kinds of different aspects of this all over the community. Uh, the first thing, one of these posts out here was a tracker to track the sun. So I was convinced by my electrician to use the tracker out here. It's, notice it's not out here anymore. Uh, because the price of the tracker, $1,500, which would have bought maybe two panels, uh, saves you the price of panels because it's always getting the most out of the sun because it's tracking it. What they don't tell you after using them is that <clears throat> if it's windy, trackers blow out of the sun. So if it's windy and sunny, you're screwed. And in super cold climates, it sort of doesn't really get started moving because it's all kind of frozen up until 11-ish. And then it quits again at 1.30 or 2. And so the and, and, and then they blow down and break, and they're big sales, and they look industrial and so on. So we learned very early on to blow off the tracker, put that money into more panels, and we made our own little racks on the front of the buildings that adjusted out for the high. Uh, they had a hinge here. They adjusted out for the high summer sun and adjusted down for the lower winter sun. That means you have to go up on your pro panel roof and fall on your ass in the snow and adjust your panels twice a year. So we started go, moving away from that. And, we, what we did, and, it, and the apparatus to even hinge these and mount them and do this cost as much as two or three more panels. So what we did was we just took, okay, we'll put all of the money for trackers and racks and everything, buy more panels, bigger panels, and we'll decide what the average year angle is, and for here it's right at 45 degrees, so if you notice on the global model, there's a 45 degree slope up here and then the steeper one, and there's where our solar energy comes to. It's halfway between the winter and summer angle, no adjustments, no moving parts, and we're fine. In other words, all of this tracking and, and, and high-tech stuff just costs money and is maintenance. The, the less technology you can get into, I mean, we're definitely using high technology. We're solar panels and, and inverters and things. But just keep it simple, and you keep the maintenance down, you keep the price down, and, and it works fine. We put all the money into panels. We do not do tracking of any kind, winter, summer, or, or uh, morning, evening, night, whatever. Uh, so that's, that's definitely the story on panels. We need, we need some masala.